Perkowski. Um, I'm very excited to introduce Seth Graham Smith here today. Uh, he's a New York Times bestselling author, screenwriter, producer, and director. Uh, he sold over two million copies of Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, as well as Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, both of which have been adapted for the big screen. He is working with Tim Burton on a sequel to the 1988 classic, Beetlejuice, um, producing Stephen King's It, and a spin-off to the Lego movie. Today he's going to talk about his new novel, The Last American Vampire, a sequel to Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. Um, it was just released this month. So um, with that, uh, let's welcome Seth. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Simon. Uh, thank all of you for taking time out of your day to come and, I guess, be part of the inaugural uh, uh, talk at Google here at the, uh, the Tech Corners campus. Uh, I will be your guinea pig for today, and uh, I'll try to keep it light and interactive. Um, so uh, what I typically like to do is just talk for maybe seven to ten minutes, and then while I'm talking, if you guys think of questions or things you want to yell at me or challenge me on or, or, uh, or et cetera, then uh, we can have a conversation rather than just make this a monologue. Uh, it's always more fun for me that way. Um, so it's interesting being here at Google, and I've done uh, talks at other Google sites before because I think that you guys are in the middle of what publishing is going to look like in a few years. Uh, I think it's no secret that uh, physical book sales are plummeting, and that's putting it kindly. Um, Barnes & Noble is the only chain left uh, in the United States of, of any real uh, power, and they are closing stores. Uh, Borders is gone. I think Walden Books is either gone or almost gone. Uh, it's very, very hard to find shelf space to, f to sell a physical book these days. Um, and yet people are reading more than ever. They're reading on their Kindles. They're reading on their iPads. They're reading on their phones, on the train, on the way to work. They're listening to books uh, in their earphones on, on Audible. So it's not that stories are dead. It's not that you know the sky is falling and that no one's going to read anymore, but the way that people are reading is changing faster than most people can even keep up. Uh, and I was telling Simon before we, we began today that I was on my way to an event at a physical bookstore in New York last week, and uh, you know to get people to come out to a physical bookstore in 20-degree weather on a weeknight in a big city where there's a lot of distractions is very hard. And I knew it was going to be one of those, you know, we'll be lucky to have 20 people kind of events. And, and, uh, and sure enough, as I'm driving through uh, Times Square to go to the event, there's a huge video wall in Times Square. And there's a Google Play ad playing the size of a building. And there's this big book that says, play books. And it's just rotating. And I just felt like there's a message here. Some, somebody's telling me something. Uh, uh, and I think that what you're going to see is you're going to see authors uh, continue to publish physical books. I think there's always going to be a market for the physical uh, to some degree. But I think you're going to see authors self-publishing more. And I'm not talking about people who are starting out. I'm talking about people who sold a lot of books. You're going to see them self-publish or you're going to see them doing partnerships with Google Play, with Amazon, uh, and so on and so forth. Because... That you guys here at Google have a broader reach in terms of uh, aggregating content or in pushing people to media than any publishing company in the world. Probably all the publishing companies in the world combined. Uh, and so, for storytellers like myself, uh, who on the movie and TV side have begun doing direct deals with Netflix for original movies and original shows, direct deals. Just the other day, we read about. Amazon is now going to get into the theatrical movie business. In the 5 to $25 million range, they're going to do a short theatrical window followed by an Amazon Prime exclusive right after the theatrical window closes. That's the norm. It's not that, you know, oh, well, this is going to be 5 to 10 years from now. We'll have to start thinking about it. No, it's here. Publishing the way we knew it is, is over. Uh, Hollywood uh, uh, distribution and production the way we knew it is over. And, so, and that's great. Because 
we shouldn't be afraid of it. We should be celebrating the fact that we have more opportunities as storytellers to reach people. And we have more opportunities to reach, you know, a targeted group of people without, I mean, say you write a book about, you know, uh, you're really into science fiction about ducks, okay? Just as a weird example that I don't know why I just said it. But in, in today's world, or the world of five years ago, no one's going to buy a book for that niche market of people who love ducks and love science fiction. But now in today's world, since it costs almost nothing to distribute electronically, if you can find someone willing to put up just a tiny bit of money, even if you do it yourself, to package that as a, you know, however you have to format it for ebooks, you can now publish a book about ducks in the science fiction universe and reach the three people who will read that book. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, and the same is true of an Amazon Prime show or a Netflix show. Uh, the same is true of, frankly, uh, a premium cable show. You don't, have to, you don't have to reach 20 million people in order to make it make economic sense. So uh, I, just, I, I get excited being here uh, because being here is... It's kind of the opposite of the way I usually feel when I walk onto a studio lot or into a big publishing house. There is explosive growth and nothing but upside in this building. And, you know, the opportunities uh, are presenting themselves on an almost daily basis in terms of what Google can do. Um, you know, when I published Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter five years ago, it was roughly a 50 50 ebook to physical book ratio. Maybe 60-40 in favor of physical, actually. Uh, now, five years later, with all those bookstores that I named earlier, those chains closed, there is half the retail space in the United States that there was five years ago for books. That means half the, the, uh, the, the shelf space for us to put our books on, for people to wander into bookstores, find your book, pull it off a shelf, and buy it. So, the ratio is now closer to 70-30 in favor of digital or ebook versus physical. So the writing's on the wall. And, you know, I think that you're going to see publishers, and I, again, I'm talking about the, the James Pattersons and the Preston and Childs and the, you know, the, and the Stephen Kings even. I, th I think you're going to start seeing them experiment with direct-to-digital. And I think you're going to see people do a publishing deal with a Google or with an Amazon um, directly instead of going through a random house, a Simon and Schuster, um, and uh, and I'm sure someone at my publisher is going to see this talk online and freak out, and I'm going to get a call. But you know, I'm happy, you guys. I'm good. I'm good. I'm I'm not going anywhere yet. I owe you one more book contractually anyway, so I can't. Uh, but uh, but it, it's uh, it's an exciting time. It's a scary time to be in media. Uh, as a content creator, and you know, the first thing that any of the quote-unquote old guard producers that I meet will tell you is, "Well, you're not going to make the kind of money I made," you know, and they, they love telling you that, and they because you know, in the in the heyday of the '80s and the '90s, when you know producers and directors were getting 25% of first dollar gross, which means that for every ticket sold, they get 25% right off the top into their pockets. Those deals are gone. Those producer deals are over. The Joel Silvers of the 80s, you know, those, that's gone. You have to now be lean and mean. It's, it's not about sending in a platoon to make a movie anymore. It's about sending in a SEAL team. And that means everybody has to know how to do seven things. Um, so for a guy like me who I can write a movie, I can direct a movie, I can produce a movie, it's actually a pretty good time to be getting into the business. Uh, and for you guys... Uh, as a company, I mean, it's just extraordinary. You think about the fact that this company didn't exist 15 years ago. And now it's, you, you can't build the buildings fast enough. Uh, you're, you're, you're outgrowing campuses. You're, you're, uh, it's just extraordinary. And, and it's exciting to think about what that means for somebody like me. Uh, I also told Simon that, uh, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a Google, but I am a Chrome user. Uh, uh, and um, the Chrome browser will be open whenever I'm writing a book because my books tend to deal with a lot of history and they're very research intens intensive. And, and even as I'm writing, I've got like 20 Wikipedia tabs open and I'm just shuttling around between tabs in the browser or typing something in to verify something and make sure it's historically accurate. Or, uh, and, 
and then the fact that we made this book trailer just to premiere on YouTube. Because now, again, Google is part of the way we reach people. Google is now the way that I research my books and write them. And Google is now a huge part of the way that I reach out to my readers and let them know the book exists. Uh, and I think that kind of partnership is only be, be going, becoming more strong. And eventually, you know, I think that as much as I hate to say because I love physical books and I grew up in a very physical book-oriented household, um, I think that uh, you're going to be able to buy physical books in boutiques and everybody else is going to be downloading. Um, and as long as we can figure out how to reach those people and get them excited about stories, then frankly, how they consume them is up to them. I, I'm, I, you know, I'm not a purist in the sense of, well, it's, you know, I would never, uh, it, physical books are far superior because you can feel the weight of them. You know what? It's not about that. It, all the purists and, and you know, again, it, the people who will tell you that vinyl sounds better, and I'm sure it does, uh, but it's not about whether you listen to it on vinyl or listen to it as an MP3. It's the, it's the content. It's the song, and it's not about whether you read it on your phone, although that's bad for your eyes, people, um, or, you know, curled up by the fire with a heavy thousand-page, you know, novel. It's the story. So I guess, you know, I guess we'll see. And, uh, and there are people who will vehemently disagree with that. There are people who say it's not the same, that, well, you know, to them I say whether or not it is or isn't, it's irrelevant. We're going that way. So it's get on or get off. Uh, and I'm excited to get on because I want to keep writing books and I want people to keep reading them. Um, anyway, uh, so just for take a couple minutes and then I, I want to hear questions. Some I, I really like to be more interactive. Um, I did grow up in a very book-centric household. My mother was an editor for a small publishing company in Connecticut, uh, still is. My stepfather was, uh, he ran a bookstore and he had a mail order book business. And so our basement at home was all shelves. And there was literally the type of thing where you were always stepping over a pile of books in our house. And we had 5,000 volumes in the basement. My stepfather was always down there doing something. And, uh, and he was really into fantasy and science fiction and horror. And so when I was a kid growing up, it was Bradbury and Heinlein and Asimov and it was King and it was Kuntz. And at a very inappropriately early age, I started grabbing those books off the shelves and, you know, sneaking little. There's something exciting about reading, you know, The Shining when you're eight uh, and horrible <laughs> at, the, at the same time. Um, and, uh, and I became infatuated and I became uh, uh, infatuated with reading. And for anyone who does any writing of their own, there's only two ways to get any good at it. And that's write a lot and read a lot. That's it. Secrets out. Um, and so I did a lot of that. I wrote my own stories, and, and yet I was fascinated with the movies. Um, from my little town in Connecticut, I had no connection to the movie business. I didn't know anything about it, but I was fascinated. And, and instead of cutting out pictures of, of, of sports heroes and Lamborghinis, this was the 80s, so Lamborghinis, um, uh, I cut out pictures of Francis Ford Coppola from Premier Magazine and pasted them on my wall like they were my, my idols. And... And uh, so I was that kid, and I was the kid who had his own show on the public access station and ran around with the big VHS camera making the movies at school and, you know, not extremely popular, but that's okay. Uh, and, uh, and so I went to film school, and, and the whole thing was about going out to L.A. and getting that big film job. And for about 10 years, I was just another struggling writer in L.A., uh, writing at night, going to my job by day and sort of on the big hamster wheel, not getting anywhere. And it was only when I went back and wrote a book, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, uh, about six years ago, that my film career took off. And so it was strange that this book background that I had come from and this fascination with books as a kid is ultimately what led me to the movies, in a way. And uh, And so now I'm lucky enough to be involved in, in a lot of the things that uh, Simon mentioned and, and to have worked with a lot of the people that I used to have plastered on my wall, which is weird and exciting and scary and, uh, 
And I've learned a tremendous amount from those people and, and from having gone through the process of making movies now a couple times, spectacularly failing on my, uh, falling on my face uh, at least once or twice and, and uh, learning from that experience. And, you know, and so here I am. Uh, so does anyone have a question? I'll, I can keep talking until, I, all right, so I see, yes, sir. Oh, and he's going to make his way to the mic because we're going to do the, uh, please bring your questions to the mic. This is like a, a town hall meeting. Yes. Yes, citizen. The first Beetlejuice film ended with Beetlejuice in a waiting room. Yeah. With his ticket number saying about nine trillion. Yeah. Is that why it's taken 25 years to do a sequel? Yes. Is that it's how exactly. The like, it was always planned that way. Yeah. If you look, it's it's the it's actually 28 years this year, which is weird. Is it 20? No, it's next year. It's 28 years. 27 years. Um, no, I think that the scariest thing about potentially doing a Beetlejuice sequel is the fact that I feel like as a writer, there are only degrees of how badly I can screw it up. It's not, it's not about degrees of how well I can do it. It's about from the get-go, because the first film is so original and, and doesn't really beg for a sequel in any way, shape, or form. And it's been 27 years and the world has gotten on just fine uh, with, without a sequel, although maybe that's why there's ISIS. Um, but, uh, but... You know, but at the same time, I know that it's something that Tim was excited about returning to and something that Michael Keaton was excited about returning to. And based on the fact that it's always the first question I get anywhere I go, it's something that is very still it's still very much in the public consciousness. Now, is that a reason to make it? No, but if we make it well, uh, then maybe we can become a self-justifying film. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but I wrote the draft a couple of years ago, and we've been sort of kicking around how we're going to get it made. And uh, and if it comes together, and I hope it does, it'll be a very scary year for me because I'll be just walking that tightrope. I don't know what it is about me and touching third rails of cultural significance. Abraham Lincoln, the Bible, uh, the... <laughs> Jane Austen, uh, there's, yeah, ex I, there's something, I just can't help myself, but uh, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, so for years, um, kind of getting onto shelves and getting really uh, publicized required putting, working with uh, a production team and the editors, and not only does that do the gating, it also gets them to help push you to edit and to move things to become higher quality, at least according to their standards. I wonder, what you think will end up happening as you no longer are, as an author, required to work with a professional editor? And That's a good question. There's always been a relationship as far back as, as you know, any real publishing goes in, in terms of, you know, uh, let's say, just for argument's sake, the 17th or 18th century when, you know, you would sell your works as a serial in a magazine or, or and then turn them into a novel. Uh, certainly in Hollywood, going back to the dawn of Hollywood, there's always been the producer, the studio. There's this relationship between creator and aggregator. And th that relationship and the collaborative nature of that relationship ultimately makes content better, in theory anyway. And most of the time it does. Um, I think that no matter what happens to the distribution, whether we're talking about you're selling your books directly through Amazon or through Google, you're selling your movie directly through Amazon or through Netflix or what have you, or just putting it on YouTube. I think that the things that will be the most successful will be the aggregated content. I think that there will be the edited content. I think that there'll always be some kind of relationship there because you can't, there, there are people who can create in a vacuum, all right? But not all of us are Paul Thomas Anderson or Upton Sinclair or, you know, we're not all these sort of, you know, uh, self-reliant geniuses, certainly I'm not. I, I benefit from the interaction with an editor or with a producer or director, an actor, other writers. Uh, I, I don't always like the process of getting notes and having to respond to them, but getting challenged, I mean, I, I say to people, it's, you know, your work is going to be exposed at one point or another. Would you like it to be exposed in a small group of people talking about it at a table? Or would you like it to be exposed when it goes out into the world and gets horrible reviews? Um, so I think that the, the work that is going to continue to be top notch is going to be the stuff that's been put through some kind of uh, some kind of editorial process. 
But, I mean, you could also point to the fact that, you know, there are, I don't know, you guys tell me how many, you know, how many YouTube videos get uploaded every minute, every hour, every day, right? Uh, of those, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of videos, uh, maybe, you know, it, just to pull a statistic completely out of my butt, uh, maybe, you know, one thousandth of one percent of those will cue more than 100,000 views or even 10,000 views. I don't know. It's probably something staggering, right? So it's still a very, very small portion of things that aren't produced in some kind of professional sphere or some kind of, uh, with some kind of editorial uh, hurdle that they have to clear that actually break through and are actually of any uh, creative significance, I guess, if that makes any sense. Anyone? Bueller? Yes. Do you still read books? Oh yeah, all the time. I still read books. No, I, I, I uh, because you, you have to, you know, it's my craft and you can't create in a vacuum and you can't, you know, exist as a creator without knowing what else is being created for the same reason that when I'm writing a TV show about a certain subject or for a certain network, I immerse myself in it um, because I want to know realistically, you know, uh, well, I also want to know who's doing it better always. But for most of the, the most uh, important reason is I love to do it. I mean, I have a book on, uh, well, I have an iPad with me, but the book I'm reading right now on the road these last two weeks doing this book tour is uh, In the Garden of Beasts by Eric Larson, which is a terrific, if you ever read uh, uh, The Devil in the White City, uh, the story of the serial killer at the uh, World Expo in the late 1800s, I think it was, Eric Larson's a fantastic guy who knows how to tell a nonfiction historical story in a very sort of almost fictional way. It's, it's very sensational. Um, I get inspired by watching films by people who make films better than I do. I get inspired by reading people who uh, write more uh, elegantly or more viscerally than I do, uh, and I steal from them, which is the best. I mean, you just you steal the tricks that work. You know what is that? The the good artists imitate the great artists steal. I, you know, and uh, and and I still I still curl up with a Stephen King all the time. You know, I I never grew out of that. That teenage boy uh, still loves me some Stephen King. I read every new thing when it comes out. Uh, I read his book, uh, his 1999 book on writing. Uh, every year and ar around the holidays is sort of a refresher course. If anyone here is interested in, in writing fiction, uh, do yourself a favor and pick that book up because there's no one, I don't know anyone who's boiled the craft down to a sort of more accessible and and folksy wisdom type of uh, of, of essence that, than he did in that book. Yes, sir? So to um, move the conversation a little bit back towards Rampart, or in this case, the book, um, I wanted to see when you were writing this new book, um, what sort of historical inspirations did you take? Were you sitting down with a world hist AP European history textbook saying there's vampire in here in some ways, not others? Like, how did you approach the new time frame? Right. Um, well, I knew this was going to be the story continuing from the first book. The first book was essentially the story uh, of Abe Lincoln's life, and it culminated in the Civil War. So essentially, uh, uh, you're talking about uh, Abe was killed in 1865, so that was the end of the story. And there is a little epilogue at the end of that book where we jump ahead uh, 98 years and sort of tease something that might have happened. And so that was the inspiration for this story is, is well, what was that 98 years that we didn't learn about at the very end of... Uh, and I kept missing these characters and wanted to go back to them, and I had such fun writing the first book. And... Uh, and I thought, well, that 98 years is the story of America. It's um, the American century. And where in the first book we only had the Civil War, in this book we have two world wars. We have Vietnam, we have the space race, we have Hitler, we have the Hindenburg, we have Soviet Union, we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, we have the, the rise of anarchy in the Industrial Age. And uh, there's so much history there. And, and, you know, telling the story of the last American vampire uh, against the backdrop of really the American century seemed like it would be a lot of fun, and it was, but it was also a lot of work. Um, and then I just did what I always do, which is I, I looked at the broad, the sort of 
you know, Howard's in People's History of the United States version of the 20th century, and then uh, looked at the events that were the most cataclysmic and the most, uh, the, the so-called turning point events, and then started to lay those out and go, okay, well then, how would the story intersect here, and how would their meaning there, Abe and Henry's uh, 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 sort of involvement in, say, World War I, then lead to their involvement in, uh, you know, uh, pre-Nazi Germany or, or you know, uh, brown shirt Germany. I mean, so y it was just a process of whittling down to the major things that I wanted to do and then researching intensely those specific things uh, and, uh, and, and outlining a story that would, would weave me through it. Yes. Have you developed a ritual? So in my mind, I'm thinking of misery and James Caan and <laughs> sort of. That know, is how. That's basically how I approach writing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My uh, my 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 keyboard is my my Annie. <laughs> she hobbles me every day. Yes, I'm sorry, but what was your? Do you have a ritual? Have you developed a ritual over time now that you do before or after? Or... Yes. Okay. Heavy heavy uh, breathing exercises and yoga. No. Uh, uh, heavy heavy coffee consumption. Unfortunately. Um, uh, my ritual is that I treat writing like a job. I do it seven days a week, no matter where in the world I am, even if I do it on a plane or uh, on a pad of paper uh, between meetings. Uh, you know, I have files, uh, uh, note files on my phone that run very deep in terms of, you know, continuing stories where I left up. But mostly uh, when, I'm, when I'm in home, at my home base, which is Los Angeles, I have an office in the city where uh, I go Monday through Friday. I show up in the morning, uh, sit down at my desk, and I write for about three hours. And then the middle of the day is for emails, calls, uh, meetings, other projects, film projects, television. Uh, and then I have lunch, and then I come back, and I do another two and a half, three hours in the afternoon. And, and those are my you know, roughly six hours, five and a half, six hours of writing a day, Monday through Friday. Uh, if I'm writing a book or if it's an especially intense time, I'll add a third shift at home. I'll go to the home office. I'll put my two uh, little sons in the bathtub and put them to bed and get a third cup of coffee and say, good night, wife, and go and disappear into my hellhole for another two hours, probably maybe two, three hours, depending on what I'm doing. Uh, and then on the weekends, um, you know, usually it's, it's doing dad stuff during the day and then writing at night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir? So um, another thing about uh, moving away from physical books, um, I feel like to a certain extent there's a sentimental value of like having a physical book by your favorite author, um, and possibly signed, um, and do you see the market of that, how do you see that? I, I, I don't think that physical books are ever gonna completely disappear. I think there'll always be a market for physical media. Um, you're looking at a guy who still buys movies on Blu-ray. Uh, and by the way, if I have a favorite movie, I will download it through, you know, through uh, uh, either iTunes or, yeah, <laughs> through play, through play, sorry. What was I talking about? Right. Right. I'll open Chrome. I'll go to BitTorrent. No, uh, <laughs> never. Uh, and then I will also buy the physical version just so I have it. I am a collector. And the same is true of books. The books that I love, they're on my Kindle or my iPad, but they're also physical. I buy the physical because I want them on my shelf. Because when you walk into someone's home, and this is probably still a generational thing, but their bookshelf looks back at you and is a representation of at least how they want you to see them, so it could be, look at how smart I am, or, you know, look at how much I love vampires, or, you know. Uh, so, uh, so no, I didn't mean to say that the physical is always is gonna disappear. I think that the, the physical will, I think that physical books will become vinyl, and, you know, if you look at vinyl, the vinyl sales from five years ago, six years ago, actually way up, uh, because it went away for a while, and then it became cool, and now, you know, and now, Everyone in Brooklyn buys vinyl. But uh, I, I think that, you know, books, just for the very reason you said, that the physical, just like I don't think retail will ever completely disappear because there's something about going into a store not knowing what you want and just feeling things and having a tactile retail experience that people are always going to crave. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, sir, you want to close it out? 
Um, a question on um, your starting with your uh, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Sure. You kind of um, supposedly created the mashup market and stuff. People say that. I, did, I didn't say that. <laughs> What was your inspiration and process that you suddenly came up with this kind of idea of these coming together? And then the second part is, yeah. do you think there's, because you're going to the digital media, the way that you write, the output you kind of produce, how is that maybe changing versus uh, your primary market being physical? Interesting. Um, for the first part, I can't take credit for the inspiration. The inspiration belongs to a, a man named Jason Rukulak, who was my editor at a small publishing company in Philadelphia called Quirk. And I had been pestering him about wanting to write something fictional, and uh, they didn't. They weren't a fictional house back then. I had written some books for them uh, that. Uh, well, I'll let you look them up if you feel like it. But they're <laughs> they're different, um, and uh, and I loved working for them. But I was dying to do something fictional, and it was Jason who came up with the idea of well, why don't we put something weird with something old, and so he had made this list. Uh, on the left hand column uh, was you know. Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre and Pride and Prejudice and you know uh, uh, Sense and Sensibility and on the right it was ninjas, pirates, uh, werewolves and you know and he was just sitting there at his desk and just started drawing connections and he called me and he said and I'll never forget this call because it's the call that completely turned my life upside down you know what about Pride and Prejudice with zombies in it and I just said I'll have it for you in six weeks <laughs> like I was so excited I, I literally remember this I was in my little apartment just jumping up and down. I read every Jane Austen book. Uh, well, I didn't read every one. I don't think I read North and Jirabi. But uh, anyway, but I read the big ones and just just immersed myself in the voice and in the period and and annotated my little Pride and Prejudice copy with all my little ideas and then just sat down writing for six weeks and and dashed it out. Uh, now the second part, I don't know is the short answer. How my process is going to change as things become sort of more digital. I think that you've already seen people like the aforementioned uh, Stephen King uh, experiment with serialization on the web. Uh, he did it with, uh, it was called Ride the Bullet, and then he did it with the Green Mile. Um, and uh, I think that serializing uh, online and maybe, you know, doing a paper chapter uh, basis or, you know, or, uh, or even, you know, I've thought about, well, what if you release a book as an app and each chapter is essentially an in-app purchase. So the app is free, and you get the first, say, three chapters of a book for free. Then if you want to keep reading, you know, the next three chapters are $1.99, and the next three chapters are... So I think this is where we're headed. I don't know how it'll change the, the writing process, other than maybe the end of each chapter will have to be really enticing. Uh, you know, every chapter will be a cliffhanger, and, and uh, but, uh, but we'll see. All I know is that it is going to change. And, uh, and that we're going to have to change with it. And, uh, and that everybody here is working for a company that's going to be a major part of that change. And so uh, I'm, glad we, we, I'm glad we all had this chance to chat. Um, I'm really appreciative that you guys took the time and, and really appreciative to Simon and everyone here at Google for having me back for another talk. And I love being here. And so give yourselves a hand. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.